Hi, I'm Annie. I'm the founder of IRL Art. We're based out of Denver, Colorado. We have a brick and mortar gallery there. And we also, in the main room, did the metaverse display. So we built Filecoin's headquarters in the metaverse with an incredible team. Uh, several of them are here, Yule Tech and Chris Clavio and Jonathan Palmer. And we have some of our team members right now in there holding it down, Fractilians and Kenthic and Boombox Heads. So we've got an incredible network of, of people that work on these projects. So I'll be covering IPFS for creators, uh, going through a history of the open metaverse, and then wrap it up with our resource doc. So to kick it off, we're talking about how do creators utilize IPFS. So IPFS is really the data layer to the creative applications. So with metaverse apps, you've got CryptoVoxels, Decentraland, Somnium Space, Sandbox, and Mona Gallery. And then you have NFTs that are just art, or NFTs as art, and I listed several platforms. There's dozens of NFT platforms. And with NFTs as metaverse assets, you know, there are parcels in virtual land that grant you access to build. And that's, you know, in Decentraland, Crypto Voxels, and Sandbox's model, Somnium Space as well. And then it's in-game wearables, it's in-game assets, like names. And then Mona Gallery is interestingly using NFTs as the entire transferable metaverse space. So instead of needing to buy a parcel, you can build for free and then mint your build as an NFT. And then archiving, which is a lot of what I'll cover first. But, you know, a lot of... Researchers are, you know, putting their dev logs, documentation, they're pointing them to ENS domains. And, you know, most commonly we're using HackMD and GitHubs, but there are ways to pin GitHubs to IPFS. So in most of my slides, I will have different QR codes that link to incredible different articles based on what we're talking about for further research. So some of the issues and solutions for creatives using IPFS storage is that most all of the creative dApps are paying for hosting, which makes it risky for storing image files. In case the platform ever goes away, all you'd be left with is the blockchain transaction or hash. And there's no Wayback Machine or internet archive for the metaverse. That's why documentation is so important. And ultimately, you know, we consider ourselves platform agnostics with this type of research we're doing. And we are ultimately promoting, you know, reusability and recycling of files for platforms because a lot of them are working in silos that cause a lot of friction and aren't interoperable with their files. So Solutions for managing public files is something we've, we're looking at is forming a creative data DAO that acts as a mega repository of all dev logs, research, 3D assets, and ultimately would love free file storage to maintain. And other further solutions is we're closely following the development of the Filecoin virtual machines and really excited for dApps to be able to build directly on layer zero so that ultimately they wouldn't be paying for hosting. So now I'm gonna go through some of the more fun uh, content of, of how we got to where we're at now. So I'm gonna be covering work of a researcher named Jen. He goes by Dank VR on Twitter and the M3 community. And if you go to m3org.com, it's such an incredible hub of so much research. But yeah, just in, to show our path, uh, what it means to be an open metaverse, and then I'll show some really cool use cases of different metaverse. 
So this is a to kick off our history lesson. So I got asked to be the the arts an art steward of ETH Denver in 2019, and they wanted to do an NFT gallery. And so I started reach, researching crypto art shows, seeing what other people had already done, and I find Jin's research. And this was in late 2019. He had just finished the show, and what they did was they 3D scanned this entire space in LA, and then basically took it, oh, and on that slide, there's the uh, HackMD that has all of this content, all of the files. So basically, they took the scan and ported it into crypto voxels, as well as ported it into VR chat. And what this was, you know, the intention here is to show, you know, what's possible with these files to document it and to open source it for further research and to also host meetups so that, you know, our internet community can still come to these art shows and see the artwork and hang out. And then, so I reached out to Jen. I was really blown away by what he had done. And I said, we're doing East Denver. We'd love to have your help. And so he came out and he 3D scanned the entire sports castle, which is a giant venue. And we built a gallery in crypto voxels, but then he took the 3D scan and ported it into VR chat, similarly to the crypto art show. And it was just really fun being able to, I think especially document events because they are so temporary and ephemeral. Um, and so it's really trying to take a step further beyond a recap video or photos and really find ways to document this, but to also open source it up so other people can see what's what's happened in, in more depth. So we really do see this as like our own type of metaverse internet archive. And next, in ETH Denver 2021, I was fully virtual this year because of the pandemic. And so this was us as IRL taking our first SAB at building our own space. So this was actually our very first metaverse build in crypto voxels, which I really recommend for anyone who is interested in getting into building to start with crypto voxels. It's really easy. It's really similar to Minecraft. And, you know, we hadn't really started documenting as much as we should up at this point. So this research is is just piggybacks off of our uh, our our docs that are in the other slides. So then for this year, we were able to apply for a Decentraland grant and bring on Boombox Head, which is a collaborator of Jen's, and he is running an ongoing GitHub for all of our projects now. But and leading up all of our documentation and research. But anyway, we were able to, so even just from the year before to this year, be able to learn so much and deepen our 3D skills to where we did a complete rendition of the sports castle in Denver and preserve it. And, you know, so we have just been able to really deepen our our content, our assets, all of these are up on GitHub, so anybody can open up these files, learn from it, do their own projects, and ultimately, just to kind of give an overview of the metaverse, um, Outlier Ventures did this really incredible full research. It's, you know, a 20-page doc of, of the state of the open metaverse. And in it was this slide. And I thought it was really great to just show hi-fi versus lo-fi. So lo-fi would be more of your low-poly Minecraft style worlds. Hi-fi being, you know, higher, higher definition content. But then closed versus open, right? So you don't own your assets. There's no way to really 
Oh, and that's why I think Second Life is sort of in the middle, you know, is that there are ways ways to monetize in some ways, but then open is, you know, you own the assets. There's whole economies in these games and ways to really, you know, have have a lot of ownership and creative control over you know, it's it's user owned, user ran games. So everything in these games are are created by by the users. And next up, just wanted to talk a bit about universal file types. So ultimately, VRM is based on GLTF, which GLTF is you know 3D file that you can upload and Basically, VRM is platform independent, so it's built by 3D designers that are ultimately advocating for more adoption of this, these kinds of file types, so that, you know, and the best example is crypto avatars, which allows you to create your own avatar minted as an NFT, but then you're able to bring that avatar into Somnium Space VR chat. And they also recently have limited capacity uh, to work with the central land. But ultimately, you know, platforms are creating their own closed systems. And it's really important to continue developing file types and standards that can, you know, create a truly open metaverse where your files can move seamlessly from game to game. And... That's a lot of the research and efforts that are, are being made with, with the VRM and, you know, crypto avatars being a really great example of that. And just wanted to show some more examples of some of what I'm talking about and some of our newer um, efforts. So with Mona Gallery, on the left is Yuletech, um my partner and, and member of IRL who rebuilt our gallery in Denver. So this is a one-of-one one rendition of our actual gallery space. And then on the right is Jen. So these were both bounty competitions that Mona hosts, which is also really cool. You can participate and win money. But the one on the right is Jen, who I was speaking about earlier. And he actually took a crypto voxel snapshot from the early years of crypto voxels when it was still black and white and ported it into Mona Gallery. And in an effort to, you know, show interoperability and to continue to move between worlds. And ultimately, you know, some of uh, the concerns we have with Mona Gallery um, is that it is based on Unity, which isn't fully open sourced. They, uh, Unity has terms of service if you make over 100K using Unity, and the NFTs that are on Mona are uh, FBX files minting a Unity package zip file. And they aren't future proof because of these kind of uh, nebulous terms and conditions. So ultimately, you know, I think a lot of this stuff is still a work in progress. I think that there are solutions and I think that Mona Gallery shows a really incredible template of what's possible um, with, you know, not having to buy a parcel and to be able to uh, work with at least a free software because Unity is free to be able to create in the metaverse. and. So, um, yeah, just some cool examples of how people are using Mona. So, uh, I, I, it's still one of my favorite. So, Mocha Room. So, Museum of Crypto Art is what Mocha stands for. Um, they're such an incredible organization that their intention is to preserve the true history of crypto art. And so, I believe they have probably at this point close to a thousand NFTs that were all minted before 2020. And it's an incredible collection that they're stewarding. And 
they've been trying to find different ways to you know, support their organization and their efforts. And I thought that this was a really good example of how some, someone could both promote interoperability and experimentation and open source values, but also still find a way to fundraise. So ultimately, this is a project with Untitled XYZ, an incredible developer and artist. And he did this generative 3D world project that's hosted through Mona. So you can buy the NFT through Mona, but it actually comes with the file so that then you could upload it to other worlds. So he has an example here of you know, the file that you would get in Mona but then it re-uploaded in both Decentraland and Arium. So I just think it's really incredible. It's a generative 3D metaverse project too, which is really unique. And they're just such an incredible organization. So I think a, just a really great um, rabbit hole to go down <laughs> if you're interested in this stuff. And yeah, just to wrap up, the, you know, this is a great video of our space that we built for Filecoin that's on Decentraland. We're really excited. Um, some of the future things we want to do is take this file and port it into Mona and potentially other metaverses just to continue to add to our research devlog and be able to you know, document that process, say what we ran into, what issues we have, et cetera. But in the right-hand corner, we've got an incredible resource doc on our website, irlart.com, and we're always just adding good tools and info, other people's research, and um, on the metaverse, we have several resource docs, so this is our, our metaverse one, but always just trying to aggregate good data and good info and to support people in becoming a successful independent artist or collective and to ultimately do what you love for a living. So, yeah, I don't know how much more time I have, so if I have a little bit of time, okay, five minutes. Um, but yeah, I would be happy to answer questions and if anybody has anything or wanted to um, revisit anything I talked about, I know it was a lot. <laughs> anybody? Yeah. Yeah, it's just they were able to create a file and a series of files. So it's a, like a, a collectible project on most. So each NFT, like say you buy one, is one metaverse that is through Mona. So you would have that. But it comes with a file that they've made that works in as many metaverses as possible. I'm sure there's some that it may not upload exactly right into but they've been steadily you know yeah they, they just they optimize the file that you get when you buy the piece um, so that it does work properly for each one and you know but then you could so say it didn't work for say a new metaverse or one that they haven't optimized it for you could also just pull that file up in your own software and optimize it and go through those steps and you know Every, every metaverse project also has like really great docs section and you know that's I, th I feel like worth mentioning just I think that's the difference too between like the open metaverse and closed metaverse is there's just so much good research and, and documentation out there of how to uh, build and, and do these things so and then that's why I really like M3 too so for the interoperability piece M3 has a ton of really good info about, you know, porting files between metaverses. But 
Yeah, Mocha was just a cool example of someone who specifically made a project, you know, for that intention. Yeah. Anybody else? Yeah. Well, I, you know, for instance, with our space that we have in the main room, we're live streaming. So there's been dozens, if not over 100 people visit the space today. So it's a way for other people all over the world who, for whatever reason, couldn't come to the conference, can still experience the artwork, can see the live stream, can interact with one another. I think that that's a really... That community aspect is really important, the accessibility to information and to the likeness of what we're able to experience in real life. Um, but I think, you know, especially with Mona Gallery, they're, you know, m introducing tooling where you can as the creator control what the buyer is able to do. And so it's creating this really cool interaction between the artwork that wasn't possible before. Like with the space we created in Mona Gallery with Art Gallery, the buyer of that NFT can actually swap out the NFTs and host their own art gallery in the gallery we built. So, you know, a lot of it is really experimental, but I think there's a lot of cool community aspects and, you know, people hosting shows in the metaverse. And I think it especially was very popularized during the pandemic for those reasons. Yeah. Cool. I think I got to wrap up, but I'm happy to chat after this with anybody. Thank you.